Thank you, Lara, and thank you everyone so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to have you. So what we're going to be talking about today is backyard habitat for endangered species, and we've got several to discuss, and I'm really excited about that. So what we're going to talk about specifically is we're going to go over very briefly what an endangered species is and the different types of endangered species there are. And then what we're going to do from there is we're going to go into species descriptions for a handful of species that you can find in Central Florida. So first we're going to talk a little bit about what those species are and what uh, some of their biology is. And then immediately following that, we're going to talk about what you can do as a resident to help that species. And we're going to do that for each species. So for instance, if I were talking about the gopher frog, I would give you a little bit of biology about the gopher frog. And then I would give you some tips that you can use to help the gopher frog in your area. I will not actually be discussing the gopher frog today, but he is a super cute little guy, so I do recommend that you look up some information on him if you're interested. But before we do that, we have the famous poll questions. So the first poll question that we're going to ask is true or false? Only wildlife lift listed on the state or federal endangered species lists are protected from take, molestation, or sale. And you can go ahead and vote there for us. And Lara, we've got 26 people, so if we could wait until we have at least 20, that'd be great. If we can get them. All right, actually, that might be pretty good. OK, so most of you got it correct. It is not just wildlife who are on the state or federal endangered species list which are protected. Um, there are other protections out there. So let's go ahead and get that poll question out of the way. All right, so we have many, many laws which exist to prohibit um, people from pursuing, molesting, harm, harassment, et cetera, and et cetera. Um, this covers whole species, so the entire critter, alive or dead, you cannot do these things to it. Um, but it also includes pieces of that critter. So if you're familiar with international wildlife laws or our federally endangered species, um, sometimes they wind up in the news because someone was caught selling a piece of that animal. So it could be ivory, it could be a bear paw, something to that degree. Um, and so this, this protection exists for any piece. And so that is to make sure that we're not encouraging people who are already planning on harming those animals. We're not giving them an easy avenue to get rid of those parts. It also tends to include habitat, nests, eggs, and breeding habitat. But that varies depending on the species and the law that refers to them. So in the bottom left hand side of your screen there, you'll see resources for endangered species. And on there you can see a bunch of different um, websites that I have listed there, including some by U.S. Fish and Wildlife on why we might be interested in saving endangered species, but also the local Florida list and the federal endangered species list as well. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom of that resource, there is a link for laws that protect Florida's wildlife. And that link is a UF IFAS extension document, which goes into a little detail about the purpose of many of our wildlife laws. And as Lara said earlier, this webinar is not to be used as legal advice. Um, we're just going to be very briefly talking about these different laws. But please do not take anything that we may say or present here as the letter of the law. As always, seek legal advice from a lawyer if you should need it. So the two classifications that people are most familiar with are the Federal Endangered Species List. Uh, it's also referred to as the Threatened and Endangered Species List or the T&E Species. But there are many other protections that are included in the Endangered Species Act as well. 
there are species of concern, candidate species, a species that may be plentiful and abundant but looks very similar to an endangered or threatened species may also be listed as a threatened species to prevent accidental take of that endangered species. And then they are also on the list for a transitional period if they are proposed for endangered or threatened status or for delisting. So a great example of, um, of a species that has a similar appearance could be the alligator and the crocodile. And so that is a good example for that there. Then we also have the state lists. And so we have the same threatened um, on the state list and species of special concern. And then there's also any species that is on the federal threatened list can be listed as threatened at the state level, even if it's not threatened at the state level. So for instance, if we had a critter that is super abundant here in Florida, but there's that endangered species that it looks like, either in part of its habitat or in a significant portion of its habitat, it could be listed simply because it's on the federal list as well. And then these are some of our other wildlife protection acts. So the Lacey Act is one that a lot of people are really familiar with. And what this one does is it prohibits interstate and international commerce of wildlife. Um, wildlife can mean any animal, bird, amphibian, mollusk, crustacean. It includes um, those animals' dead bodies, skin, eggs, or young. Uh, this act was first enacted in 1900, and in 1981, we added the Black Bass Act, which was incorporated into it. And um, since then, it's been updated numerous times, and um, it was expanded to plants in 2008, uh, so not just animals. Migratory bird treaties are another um, very commonly known legal act to protect species. Originally, this was simply between the United States and Canada. That was in 1918. But they added Mexico, Japan, and the USSR, which is now Russia. Um, and that treaty states that it's unlawful to pursue, hunt, capture, kill, possess for sale, purchase, or deliver any migratory birds. And that includes their eggs, nests, and body parts. And this was um, part of this act was as a result of the fashion industry and how we were um, using a lot of these species for hats and other fashionable items. Uh, another, another one that is discussed is the Pittman-Robinson Act, which is also known as the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act. So this one provides federal money to states that are going to manage game and non-game wildlife restoration. Um, funds come from sporting goods such as ammunition and arms. And those sales, or the, the pro, um, portion of those sales, go to the states based on the land area and number of hunters in each state. So this is one of the great examples of how hunters and anti-hunting wildlife enthusiasts are both trying to help out wildlife. So simply by being a hunter and purchasing items you might use for hunting, you're actually funding wildlife conservation. So it's important when we're talking about conservation to really talk about what the issues and true threats to those wildlife species are and make sure that you're working with everyone who also cares about that species. Just because someone is into hunting does not mean that they are not someone who cares very deeply for our wildlife. Another important act that we have here is the Bald Eagle Protection Act. This one was originally from 1940, and it protected bald and golden eagles in the United States and any lands within its jurisdiction. But it prohibits the sale, harassment, purchase, transportation, um, or movement of bald and golden eagles, including nests, feathers, body parts, and eggs. Um, and it was amended in the mid-90s to allow some distribution of eagle feathers for our Native American uh, populations and their religious acts that, are, um, that use a lot of these parts. And so there is an exemption built into that for our Native people. Um, so another one we have is the Marine Mammal Act. This one is from 1972, part of that great uh, decade of environmental conservation 
and this one includes any marine mammal such as manatees, dolphins, and whales that may be in danger of extinction as a result of human activity. It also prohibits the take of marine animal, mammals in U.S. waters and um, by U.S. citizens outside of U.S. waters. So this is an important one for our marine wildlife. And as I said before, you can find more information about these acts and many, many others at that UF IFAS extension document linked below under laws that protect Florida's wildlife. There are probably 15 more laws in that document that you could um, look at and learn about. So like any law that we have in, in Florida and nationwide, um, they're open to interpretation and enforcement. So this is where your political um, thoughts and opinions may have an, an impact on wildlife. And so if it's something that you care deeply about, you might want to look into what, your, um, what the people you have to vote between, what they have done in the past regarding wildlife and wildlife funding, and maybe expand on that and look at what they've done for conservation lands as well. So just like any other part of the political process, being an engaged citizen is important, and knowing how various people at different levels of local, state, and federal government have approached these topics might influence your decision. So as always, we are impartial and non-partisan here at UF IFAS Extension, but if wildlife is something that you are interested in, you might want to look at these different aspects of the laws and just know how it works at your local level. So again, we are not giving legal advice. That is my final disclaimer on that uh, remark. So let's get into some of the species, the reason y'all are actually here. And we have another poll question. This one is an open-ended question, so we'll see how that uh, works. Oh dear, Lara disappeared. I don't know what I did. Um, I still see Maybe I it make on another my one? end. I don't know if can people see it on their end. I don't see any responses coming in. Oh, okay. You see it. Are people oh, responding? Go. I can't see it. I just got one answer that came in. Let me see if I broadcast results. Can you see it now? Oh, there they are. They're coming in. I don't know why you can't see it, though. It's okay. As long as you can, we're good. Read the answers to you, if you would like. <laughs> I'll just tell you the right answer when you close it. We've got 10 responses so far. OK. Then. All right, do we have enough responses that I can give you the answer? Probably, there's 12, so we'll take it because I'm... All right, so you still can't see it just to... Okay, so... I can't, can but the question the was, what is the... Answer. Okay, so the first step that a resident should take to protect um, threatened and endangered species in their area is simply learn about the species that you might have in your area and figure out where they are, what habitats they like, and if those habitats are present near you. And so that might seem like a trick question because it's super basic, but that really is the first challenge a lot of people have is they don't know what endangered species or threatened species are near them. So before we get into some of the individual species, I wanted to cover a few that are not often found in backyards. So these are species that are listed at the state level and the federal level, and a lot of them require large tracts of land that are managed in a very precise fashion. So eastern indigo snakes are, you can see them anywhere in the state of Florida if you're about the luckiest person on the planet. I have been trying for years. I still haven't gotten to see one in the wild. But they're a beautiful snake that can get up to um, eight feet long. They really prefer ridge habitats and um, areas that are managed 
in that in that way. Uh, they're non-venomous. They are quite large. They're that very dark black, almost purpley black color. Uh, a very heavy-bodied snake. A lot of our other native snakes, which are this size, are quite thin. Um, they don't have a really heavy looking appearance to them, but the eastern indigo snake can grow quite, quite large and it can have a throat that's reddish or pink and so that's a good way to distinguish it from the black racer. The black racer has a white chin. Another one is the Florida bonneted bat. This bat is one of or is the largest bat that we have in the area, but it is also the rarest. Um, it's really only found in very small populations, um, mostly in very, very south Florida, but recently there have been some populations that have been seen in the central Florida Ridge area, and FWC is currently doing some survey work to see if they have bonneted bats in the area. They also have a call that you can hear and recognize, so that's one of the ways that FWC is surveying for the Florida bonneted bat. It can get quite large, like I said, it can get almost a wingspan of 20 inches, and they are primarily a insectivorous bat, uh, but we don't really know too much about the life history because they are so rare. So they're super cool, but you're probably not going to see them in, their, in your backyard unless you live in a very rural area near the outside of Naples or quite possibly in the frost-proof area, but quite rare. The red cockaded woodpecker is one that a lot of Floridians are familiar with, and this species can be seen in Ocala, especially in the National Forest, and on other large tracts of fire-maintained pine ecosystem. The red cockaded woodpecker requires um, mature pine trees that uh, have an open canopy below, and so as a result of that, their habitat is quite limited. Another one is the Florida scrub jay. This is another species that Floridians tend to be familiar with. It's an endemic species that we have here. You can also find it in the ridge ecosystem. Uh, the ridge, as you can tell, is a common theme here. It has a lot of species that are rare, threatened, or endangered. Um, the, the scrub jay is very unique in Florida in that it's a species that raises its young as a family. They have this um, beautiful blue color to them, and they're considered a very nice songbird, but their habitat, um, that fire-dependent scrub ecosystem, is deteriorating and being developed in the state. So there are now areas that are protected for scrub jay, but it's just a super cool bird. If you get the chance to see a family unit of scrub jays, it's something you'll probably never forget. Another one is the crested caracara, and this is one of my favorite birds. He's so funny looking. I love his little um, brown hat or toupee that it looks like he's wearing, especially if there's a wind coming from behind them. It'll kind of flip up. It looks like he's got a little toupee on. You can see these birds in Central Florida. They tend to be uh, near pastures and rangelands in South Central and Central Florida, especially over by the ridge. I see them most often on the fence posts driving from Winter Haven to Sebring or uh, to Zephyr Hills or going near the Peace River. So when you get out into those big open cattle lands, that's where you're most likely to see a caracara. They, in my anecdotal experience, they tend to hang out near or around um, vultures, but that is not required for them. That's just where I happen to notice them most frequently. But they're a super fun bird to see, quite large, very unique, in its, um, in its look there. So the first individual species we're going to talk about is the Sherman's fox squirrel. This is a squirrel that you are, I don't, I don't want to say unlikely to see, because um, it is possible to see them around central and north central Florida, but they are most likely going to be found in rural areas or on the edge of managed forests. Um, only about 10 to 20 percent of their historic habitat range is estimated to remain in Florida, and that's because they require those really large open areas with mature trees. Um, they're known for their big bushy tails, which is how they got the name fox squirrel, and they primarily eat longleaf pine seeds and turkey oak acorns, and because of that primary diet, that's where a lot of their habitat uh, needs are. But there are a couple of different fox squirrels found throughout Florida. The Sherman's fox squirrel um, 
is one that FWC was doing a survey for, and we and they asked Floridians who saw this fox squirrel to report them for a couple of years there, and they have concluded that reporting, so there's not a huge need to do that anymore, but they got over 6,000 reports of Sherman fox squirrel in the state, and they, are, they have a great report that you can read on the Sherman fox squirrel. So like I said, unlikely to see them in urban residential areas, but um, if you want to help protect the species, if you know they're in their area, it's a lot easier. And so what you can do is you can encourage local conservation of their habitat and encourage funding to be used for the management of that habitat. Um, like a lot of our scrub and longleaf pine ecosystem inhabitants, they require fire and proper management of the vegetation to really survive in that area. Another one you might see is the wood stork. This is one that I see all over Polk County. Um, they do have local populations that are quite abundant, but it is patchy and their habitat has shrunk dramatically, especially in South Florida. This is the largest wading bird that we have in, in the US, and it's the only stork species that breeds here. So we do have um, breeding pairs in South Carolina and the rest of the southeast, but they feed on small fish, crayfish, amphibians, and reptiles. The best way that you can help this species is to know about local populations again and their habitat requirements. And so again, encouraging local government, your city, county, um, and your FWC working groups to promote the species are a great way to help the wood stork. Something you can do as a resident if you live on a lakefront or wetland area is to avoid allowing your pets to harass the wood storks. They are quite large and many dogs will chase after them if left to their own devices to be able to do that. If you have a, a yard that backs up to a lakefront or something and you just let the dog out in the backyard when the wood storks are there, that's, uh, you know, that kind of stress isn't great for any critter. So that's, a, that's one thing that you can do as a resident. And we've got another poll question, Lara. So which of the following species are protected in the state of Florida? I know this one has a lot of options, so think carefully. All right, Lara, it looks like most people are just changing their answers back and forth now. <laughs> Excellent. So most of you got it correct. Uh, the answer is all of the above. The burrowing owl, American alligator, sandhill crane, and gopher tortoise are all protected species. Um, I did see a couple of you choose certain critters and then uh, change it to all of the above, and that is correct. So we're going to talk about those species now. The burrowing owl is another one of my favorite species in Florida. It's a Florida species of special concern, so it is not designated as threatened or endangered at this point, but it is a species we're concerned about because of habitat loss. It can occur anywhere throughout the state of Florida, but it does have um, areas where it is more abundant, and that's because like many of our other species, it prefers that open, low-growing grassland habitat that in the past would have been primarily uh, managed by fire. So these uh, real high personality birds uh, eat insects, lizards, oh, there's a typo there, sorry about that, frogs, snakes, rodents, uh, they'll eat anything small enough that they can get their, their little talons on. They don't have the ear tufts on the top of their head like the eastern screech owl might have, and they're just, they're adorable little birds there. Uh, right now you see he is sitting on a little fence post or other perch, and this is a common way to see them in pasture land, so if their burrow is next to a livestock fence, you might see them sitting up there as a way to better survey their area. This is another common way to see them, uh, full of personality and just hanging out in the grass there. So what you can do to help them is if you're in an area where their habitat has significantly been reduced and you've noticed that they are burrowing in, um, in vacant properties around your neighborhood, which happens often in South Florida, you can 
attract them to your yard if you're so interested in doing so by removing a foot or two circle of sod from your yard, exposing the bare ground. It'll give them an area where they can dig a little burrow. You can also install tea perches or just small wooden perches near their burrows. You would need to get permission for this in most cases. But th what these tea perches do is they help the bird. The um, burrowing owl can sit on that perch and look out and see predators coming and prey, but also it helps people who are mowing the area know not to go over there. So tea perches are a great way to help the burrowing owl. You can also restrict the use of insecticides near the burrow, specifically insecticides near the burrow, since the majority of their diet is insects and beetles and grasshoppers. Um, these little guys need those those insects to be there. And so if you restrict the use of pesticides, which could harm their prey items, you'll be doing them a big favor in helping their diet. These little guys, if they're near urban areas, they do eat other pest species that we don't particularly love, like spiders and cockroaches. So they can be a great species to have nearby, but they can disrupt um, youth sports if they're burrowing on athletic fields and things like that because as a protected species they cannot be evicted except with a special permit. The gopher tortoise is a candidate species on the federal list and threatened in Florida. They will usually forage within 160 feet of their burrows and can live quite a long time. They do prefer sandy areas but you can find them everywhere from dunes and beaches all the way up to the ridge ecosystems. And they, again, love that low-growing vegetation. In this case, it is because they eat a lot of that vegetation. So if you have gopher tortoises on your yard or in a park near you, the best things you can do are to avoid disturbing the burrows and keep pets away from the tortoise and the burrow because they do kind of look like a ball and every puppy I know would love to chase after one. If it's in your yard or an area where you can have an influence on what is planted nearby, consider adding some native forage species to your yard or that park. They love to eat blueberries, beauty berries, prickly pear cactus. Um, they also like saw palmetto berries and the flowers of saw palmettos. There are lots of different things that they love to eat. And by adding those forage species, you can help them stay closer to their burrow and be less likely to cross roads and other areas where they might um, be threatened. The sandhill crane is one that I get a lot of calls about and I know Lara does as well. Many people don't realize that the sandhill crane is protected. It is on the Florida threatened list and it is also protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty. We have two subspecies of sandhill crane that visit Florida. Uh, we have the residential sandhill cranes, the Florida sandhill cranes, which will breed here and you'll see their young uh, hanging out with them as they can leave as leave the nest as soon as 24 hours after hatching. And then in the winter, especially in North Florida, you'll have the large uh, flocks of sandhill cranes, the greater sandhill cranes coming from um, other parts of the country, specifically the Great Lakes area. They do prefer marshes, prairies, and pastures, but if you've been driving down the highway in Florida in the last five or 10 years, you'll notice they also like right-of-ways, yards, parks, anywhere that they can forage for their favorites, um, which are uh, grubs in the yard, worms, other small things like snakes and lizards, berries, and seeds. The best thing you can do in your area to help this species is promote peaceful coexistence. Um, the biggest complaints that I get phone calls about are birds pecking at glass doors and people's cars. The reason they're doing that is they can see their reflection in the, in the glass. And so some things you can do are you can use cling wrap on that glass for a few weeks until the birds leave. You can also put out some stakes that have string or wire tied between them, which will prevent the bird from getting close to your windows. You put that wire or a string about three feet up and it'll, when they bump into it, they'll, they'll stop there. You can also encourage people to use car covers if they're having repeated problems with the birds pecking at their car. It's important to refrain from feeding or attempting to feed sandhill cranes in all endangered and threatened species, actually all wildlife. Um, that was the message that FWC wanted to get out related sandhill cranes, is we want to avoid getting near them. Even though they are quite large birds, they do have a friendly demeanor and people will get close to them. And like many of the other species we've discussed today, you want to keep your pets um, contained and not allow them to chase and possibly attack them. 
And the last poll question we have, which brings us to the end of our presentation, which of the following is not true of the American alligator? All right, and this one we had a little bit more split on. Um, the one that is not true is that they were removed from the endangered species list. And so what happened with the American alligator is they are now abundant and therefore are not on the list as a species themselves. But because they are so closely related in appearance to the American crocodile, they are both on, they're on both the Florida and federal uh, threatened list. And that is simply because of their appearance to the crocodile. So as anyone here in Florida can tell you, they can get quite large, both in length and in weight. They are opportunistic feeders that are uh, less aggressive than crocodiles. They are not likely to go out and be super aggressive towards residents or other, other wildlife unless they're hungry and they are easy to catch. Uh, there are exceptions to that rule always, but they're quite abundant in Florida. So if you wanted to promote uh, habitat for alligators in your area, if you didn't already have a lot of them, what we're really hoping you'll do is that you'll promote smart coexistence. So you'll want to avoid allowing pets near the water with any regularity. And what I mean by that is if you have a yard that backs up to a lake or any type of water, pond, river, creek included, uh, don't just let your pet out at the same time every day, especially if they're a small pet. Uh, alligators are quite intelligent and they'll know like, hey, right about sunrise or sunset, um, this person at this one particular house lets their tiny adorable little dog go play in the water. And so if they haven't found their own food and they know that that's coming, it can present some conflict. Those are the types of calls that I tend to get. But one people forget about is please don't c clean your fish, your catch near the water and throw the guts in. That is just as much feeding an alligator as giving it a piece of chicken or something else. So make sure you're keeping all of the fish um, guts and other pieces that you might be cleaning and disposing of them properly. So please do not throw them in the water next to your dock. It becomes an attractant to alligators and other predators. So with that, we've gone through several species that you're likely to see in central Florida that are on the threatened and endangered species list in some way, shape, or form. And I'd love to take any questions you might have. I know that was kind of a whirlwind. OK, thank you, Shannon. Yeah, we have not had any questions come through to ask at this time. But certainly, if you guys have questions for Shannon now, you can type them in the chat box. And she will try and answer your question. Not sure if no questions is a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> Looks like Susan's type, a few people are. Well, I'm going to go ahead and put up the next slide in case no questions do show up. Okay, okay. well, yeah, please feel free to keep typing in those questions, but if there are no questions or if you need to leave, please click on the screen to get the evaluation survey before you leave. And if you guys are interested in registering for our next webinar on Creatures of the Night in October or the one following that in November, uh, you can do that on the link on your screen as well, the polknr.eventbrite.com. So, okay, so the first question came in from Lori, is an alligator or crocodile the one with a thin snout? That is a great question. So the crocodile is the one that has the narrow snout 
And additionally, you can see some of their lower teeth exposed on the jaw. With alligators, you can only see the teeth on the top part of the jaw. They have the much uh, broader, rounded nose to them. Um, and if you look at some, some pictures of them compared to each other, um, I like to say that the crocodiles look a little more angry. So <laughs> the alligators look a little bit more friendly, but maybe that's because we're with UF. I'm not sure. <laughs> Okay, and then um, someone was asking about, did we talk about panthers? And no, Shannon did not address panthers. I don't know, Shannon, if you want to say anything about that. I did not. I focused on species that were a little farther north than the panther. Uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife has some great information on panthers if you're interested in it. And I'll get that link for you and put it in the chat box in a minute. Um, but panthers are another species that require absolutely large tracts of land and um, development and the cross-sectioning of that habitat with roads are some of the biggest threats that they have now. Okay, and then Susan wrote a comment to you, Shannon, so I will let you read that. It's not a question. Um, Okay, I've seen wild okay. peak. Bill is asking a question. I've seen wild peacocks in an area neighborhood. Are they endangered? Peacocks are not native to our area, um, so I don't. Uh, they wouldn't be on the endangered list because they're not native to Florida. They would be an exotic species. Um, they have established some populations in different areas of Florida where they were released as pets or from livestock, but no, they are not on the, the state list. Okay, and then Jim has a question. In the event an alligator is found in a body of water near your yard, who removes it? That's a great question. So there is... It's easy to assume any body of water in Florida has alligators in it, whether or not you see them. Um, so alligators are not removed from local waters unless they are deemed to be a nuisance. Um, if they are deemed a nuisance, we do recommend that you call Florida Fish and Wildlife. And what I mean by nuisance is not that they are present but that they are exhibiting aggressive behaviors towards people. So if they've been fed, you'll, you'll notice that alligators will come towards you instead of going away from you. That's a good indication that they are becoming adapted to humans and are becoming a nuisance alligator problem, in which case we want you to contact FWC, your local office, or by calling the Wildlife Alert hotline. If the alligator is over four feet, they will call a trapper to come out, and that alligator is not relocated. He is um, disposed of, and the trapper gets to keep what they, what they capture. And so sometimes if they're smaller than four feet, they'll relocate them. It really depends on the specific incidents. But I just added a link to the chat box for the Nuisance Alligator Program. So if you do have that issue, please feel free to call FWC and talk to them about it. But an alligator being in a body of water near your home or a park that you're in is not considered a nuisance animal. They're just doing their business and hanging out where they are. Okay, and for the sake of time, I think we'll just take one last question. I know we're already at 1 o'clock. Any other questions that come in, Shannon and I will answer via email when we re um, reply to everyone that registered. So Susan was asking, have any bonneted bats um, been seen in north central Florida? We have some reports of Florida bonneted bats in the frostproof area, which is just south of Lake Wales. Uh, so FWC is currently doing surveys to see if they can find a population in central Florida. Otherwise, they have only been known to really inhabit an area near Naples and by uh, Big Cypress. So what they tend to need as far as habitat is uh, that mature forested area again. and. You can, if you think you might have them in your area and you want to provide a bat house for them, it's important to note that because bonneted bats are larger, they need a slightly different um, bat house dimensions than our other bat species do. So go ahead and contact your local extension office or your local Florida Fish and Wildlife office, and um, you can ask about the differences 
basically the slats just need to be slightly farther apart so it gives them more room to get in there. Okay. Thank you, Shannon, and thank you to everyone who tuned in for today's webinar. Um, at this time, again, if you have not completed the evaluation, if you click on the link on your screen where it says click here for evaluation survey, Shannon and I would very much appreciate your feedback and input. Um, and like I said, if you want to register for future webinars, if you haven't already, you can do so at the bottom link on your screen. Um, and again, we will send out the link to the recording and answer any other questions that were not answered within our time. So um, hope you guys have a great rest of the day and thank you again to Shannon for a great presentation.